Yeah. Inspector General of Police Mohammed Ahmed Al Hassan has warned personnel against the use of excessive force and other acts that violate the fundamental human rights of citizens. We have to apply it also in our own country so that we are able to protect citizens. We are also able to deal with criminals without uh, uh, infringing upon their human what, rights. EP was addressing 160 personnel preparing for a UN peacekeeping mission. He urged them to work harder towards building a new image and apply the skills acquired locally when they go on internal duties. These are things we should take seriously to avoid the excessive use of what? Force, especially firearms. Most of us have discharged firearms because we are lost of ideas. My name is Stephen Anti, and this is today's big story. On Big Story today, we're asking, is this warning, first of all, an affirmation of the perception that the police sometimes manhandles some members of the public unnecessarily? Do you really think the police often uses excessive force to control irate crowd? And at what point do we say the police is engaged in human rights abuse in efforts to maintain law and order? How well have our police force done in using force but not abusing the rights of those involved in any form of confusion that has arisen so far? What kind of training have they received and are they receiving in the use of force to maintain peace? Should you feel abused? by the police in the manner in which they handle you during any confusion. What should you do? My guests today really are Nana Yao Akwada, who is Executive Director of the Bureau of Public Safety. And then later we'll be joined by Chief Superintendent Na Hamza Yakubu, who is Commanding Officer of Formed Police Unit, to find answers to all the issues we are raising uh, this evening. Welcome, gentlemen. Right, uh, so we, we, we're going to engage uh, Nanao first on uh, his, his reaching us via Skype. Uh, Nanao, it's great to have you on uh, today's big story. So if you can hear me, I mean, the basic question we're asking is that at what point do we say the police is abusing an individual's human rights? Well, uh, we're having uh, challenges uh, here in Nanayakwada, so we will speak to uh, Commissioner of Police uh, Na Hamza Yakubu, uh, who will join us on telephone. So, good evening, sir, and thanks for joining us on today's big story. Right, uh, uh, this is today's big story, and we're, we're exploring the issues surrounding police using excessive force in the performance of their duty. My name is Stephen Anti. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. These are things we should take seriously to avoid the excessive use of what? Force, especially firearms. Most of us have discharged firearms because we are lost of ideas. Well, welcome back. Uh, we're now joined on the line by uh, Commissioner of Police, uh, Na. Hamza Yakubu, who is commanding officer of the formed police unit. Good evening, sir, and thanks for joining us on today's big story. Good evening, uh, but uh, let me make a co uh, correction. I'm chief superintendent. Right. Chief superintendent and not commissioner of police. Right. Chief superintendent. Uh, no, Hamza Yakubu. We're grateful that you could join us. Now, what we're exploring is exactly at what point do we say a police officer has abused the human rights of, of a citizen? Well, uh, as enshrined by the constitution of this country, every citizen has his uh, or her rights. 
and uh, all police officers in the execution of their lawful duties are enjoined to respect these rights. These, uh, the, these rights that uh, are expected to be enjoyed by everybody, mm -hmm. therefore means that every police officer in dealing with all manner of persons needs necessarily to adhere to those um, provisions in the constitution. Mm. So therefore, should a police officer exercise his powers above what is allowed by law, mm. it stands to mean the person is infringing upon the rights right. of that citizen. Right. So we, we've seen instances, several instances, where the police has used sheer brute force actually in either dispersing a crowd or in just doing its normal duties would you would you admit that sometimes the police service especially in ghana has been excessively brutal uh, that could be uh, yes and no mm. i am saying it could be yes mm. because when it is that a police officer steps beyond the requirements of the law mm then uh, yes the police has acted in excess of mm. what uh, we are expected to do mm. but then the, the same laws of the country provides that uh, we use some extent of force depending upon the circumstances that we are faced with and so it could be yes or no when it is that we act within the confines of the law and when that means uh, it, it, it is absolutely necessary mm. to use force, and that we then will be justified in the use of whatever force we might have used. And and so this is this is what, in police terms, you call reasonable force. What I mean, what I'm trying to find is that what is the threshold? At what point would you say a force applied is reasonable or excessive? Once again, it depends. For instance, whenever it is that we have to encounter demonstrators, mm. we just don't get there and begin an attack or an action to disperse the whatever crowd that mm. it is. Mm. We give warnings. We normally would warn the, uh, the members of the, the righteous crowd mm. to desist from whatever unlawful actions that they are doing. Mm. Should they be mindful to respect an order to restrain from any further havoc. We are okay with the situation. Right. But in most cases, you will find that they ignore any order to stop. And it is at that stage that we have a system we call the, the graduated, uh, graduated uh, use of force. Right. And so we jump from one um, scenario to another. We jump from one scenario to another. And that could even entail the use of lethal force when it becomes uh, extremely necessary to do that. We would, we would then uh, use that force. Right, so um, Chief Superintendent Hamza, we will have you hold. Uh, we're getting on to uh, Skype to engage Naya Kwada, who is Executive Director of Bureau of Public Safety. We tried getting him earlier, but uh, we, we had challenges with audio so he's on now so Nene Akwada, I need to find out from you I mean as somebody who is concerned with public safety uh, do you think that the Ghanaian police service in the performance of its duty sometimes are too excessive in the application of force well um, thank you very much and I think I want to go straight on to answering your question um, yes and no um yes and no because you want to look at the history of the ghana police force mm. which is now the ghana police service mm. and if you look at where they have come from um as a service or as a unit then you might want to understand the use of some excessive force but now operating under a democratic institution it is incumbent on the service that the operate in accordance with the constitution 
operate in accordance or in tenets with their, mm. um, their own service instructions. So, yes, sometimes they have used force, but I think that um, over, over the years, the approach of the Ghana Police Service to um, institution, uh, to the actions or illegal actions or crime is changing, even though not significantly, um, you know, not in huge quantum leaps that mm. are measurable over a short period. But if you look at where they have come from, one cannot but admit that, yes, the service is going under some, you know, changes. Mm. But won't you also say that sometimes members of the public actually push the police service to the limit? Uh, if, for example, a group of demonstrators are to stay in line and they, they, they don't heed instructions, sometimes it amounts to intimidating the police to, to apply these brutal force on them. Wouldn't you say the public is to blame as well sometimes? No, absolutely not. Um, like um, the chief superintendent indicated to you, the police are a trained group of people. They are trained in public order management. They are trained in controlling rioters mob, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And so they know when to use what kind of force and, as indicated, reasonable force. For instance, if it's just a crowd, that is not armed in any way, you know, um, um, that you're trying to control. They have other means of controlling such crowd without necessarily, um, you know, um, meting out to them um, some brutality. And sometimes there are even cases cracking where, their skull. I mean, like we saw yes, on TV, yes, there are people bleeding there from their heads the uh, through butting from, from police officers. Yes, there are. There are cases like that where you see the police acting using excessive mm. force. But like I indicated to you, we must appreciate where the police service is coming from and where we want to go to. Mm. There is, it's not um, for nothing that the IGP, um, since he took office, has gone on a very consistent campaign to get the police to act in very civil manner. Mm. And I think that as time moves on, we are going to see results. We are. We're hoping to see results. Uh, we still have Chief uh, Superintendent Na Hamza Yakubu on the telephone line. And so, sir, if you're, you're, you're hearing, I, I need to find out from you that the IGP raising this concern is critical. And I think that it comes at a time where police officers are undergoing some form of orientation or retraining. Can you give us a fair idea what kind of uh, training police officers get in order to be able to stay within the limits of, of human rights and dealing effectively with it? It's uh, our training uh, regime, of mm. course, and, and includes human rights issues. Mm. We adequately train our personnel across board in human rights. Mm. And one key uh, thing that we do is the issue of democratic policing. I heard uh, your, your last uh, contributor say yeah. that sometimes we use excessive force. Like I said, we do not approach situations and just go into use, uh, using excessive force. Mm. I have just told you that we have a system we call what? The use of graduated force. Mm. So until it becomes extremely necessary, we would not go to that extent. And what we want people to be conscious of is the fact that once we get into that uh, gear of using excessive force, we do so bearing in mind that whoever we are using the excessive force on might be causing more harm mm. to the uh, people having larger proportion mm. of uh, society. And so we would not sit down, wait for a few miscrimes, create, create more harm to the larger uh, number of people in society. And so that is how it operates. Right. But then the effort of the IGP to get this thing done is yes, we have changed from our previous, previously known uh, um, um, actions of being uh, uh, um, too insensitive mm. to such issues. Mm. Rightly so, we have moved into a new era 
democracy has been working over a couple of years now in Ghana, and we need to also move in that direction. That is how it is. But then we, we expect people to know mm -hmm. that the owner does not only lie on us. It takes two to tango. Whenever it is that uh, people go into such actions, why would people not ask? So, so, uh, so what you, what you mean is that the issue of human rights is, is not only the police service who should be concerned exactly. about human rights, the, 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 the right, public, the general right public you're to dealing be with. Enjoyed, uh, responsibly. Mm -hmm. Rights are to be enjoyed, uh, enjoyed responsibly. So if you think that you have rights, and for which reason you would want to cause discomfort to other people, then don't forget that the law would be on the side of the other people who are law abiding. And right. that is why our mm. actions are justified. So, so this, what you're saying seems to support the earlier argument I made, that sometimes the general citizens push the police to the limit. I mean, if they're not supposed to cross a boundary, they go ahead to cross it, uh, kind of testing what the police can do or cannot do. Do you feel like that sometimes? It is exactly the situation. That is why I said that when we get there, we start by way of advice. Mm. If you heed to the advice and subsequent orders to abate whatever confusion you are, you are causing, mm. we have no qualms with you. But if you refuse to adhere to and you want to perpetrate the unlawful act, then the same law, the laws of this country, and even internationally, internationally the UN acknowledges the fact that you can even kill in protection of uh, life and property. And that is exactly what we are always mindful of. Now, I, 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 I've experienced the police in, in two extreme ways, which I'd, I'd like to share with you. There was an afternoon yeah. when I had just stepped out for lunch and parked by the wing of the road to take a phone call. Now, in the middle of the phone call, I get uh, a SWAT team come to me and, and knock my window and ask me to roll down. I did so, and they went ahead to explain that I'm parked at a suspicious place and I need to step away from my car and be searched. I found that to be a bit intimidating, but I submitted to whatever work they had to do, and they went ahead to search me. Should the police be picking up on and, you know, this people is, like that? This is excellent policing exhibited by the team of police officers who accosted you. Mm. The police is enjoined to make sure to be on the lookout for suspicious persons and characters. Similarly, we expect members of the uh, public to also draw our attention. And that is how the law works. That is how effective police uh, organizations uh, turn out to be. When yeah. they have the cooperation of members of the public, when we don't the least suspicion, mm. draw the attention of the police. Right. That the, the person working about here I have uh, a suspicion that the person, then the police, is bound to do something. And this is where our attitude comes in. We expect that the police would approach that issue with some respect for the dignity of that person. And so, like they encountered you, they said, yes, where you fact looks suspicious, we need to search you. You necessarily have to submit to that. They have their limits. They cannot go beyond anything to harass you. All they need to do mm. is to ha do that uh, exercise with a human face. What you have not told us is whether they treated you in a very nice manner. I would wish to know mm. whether they did. Then I can comment whether well, you were right I mean, I wrong. see that this will be an opportunity for the police to sing its own praise songs. But of course, I mean, I was treated with dignity. But I, I only mentioned one example. I had another brutal experience where they didn't treat me with that dignity. So the question I was asking really was that, how come that some police officers will go ahead to do the right thing, others will not do the right thing? Does it I mean that, that, does it mean I, that I your system that. of training doesn't consider that there are individual differences and approaches of handling these things so that you could address let them us, efficiently. Let us delve into the realm of, uh, mm. of, uh, of religion. You would have some pastors, imams, and whatnot mm. not uh, conforming to what their, their teachings and practices. Mm. And so it shouldn't be strange right. that policemen, you wouldn't expect that policemen should be 100%. Right. We have various backgrounds. 
We go through the same training, but then attitude now. It depends upon the individual. Right. And this is where the police administration has launched a holistic fight against such attitudinal right. issues. Right. Uh, exactly. Right. Uh, we're grateful uh, to you, Chief Superintendent Na Hamza Yakubu. We're still yeah, engaging yeah. in a conversation and we'll still keep you on. Uh, we still have Nanaya Akwada on uh, Skype, who is also engaging us on the issue. So, Nanaya, you heard the police chief praising themselves, I mean, singing their own praise songs. Do you think the police uh, has done tremendously well for us all to be commending them? One, for the effort in, in, in place to uh, do things rightly? Okay, let me answer your questions. Um, I think that um, Chief Superintendent um, Na Yakubu um, did not do himself too well, because we are in this country. He says that the police do not use excessive force. Mm. I think that that is far from the truth. We are in this country. We have seen how innocent people. Uh, going about legitimate businesses, mm -hmm. shot and killed in a taxi that was just driving along the way. They were brutally murdered. We woke up one morning to see this. We are in this country where the police have pursued their own and shot and killed them without at no threat. Mm. So you cannot say that that was but, reasonable. But, 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 that but was are, these these were was operational errors. The police came out to clarify that these were operational errors. So are errors also considered a human rights that violation? That is precisely what we are talking about. Operational errors. When you misapply your force, it is, it is oppression and it's an error. That's precisely what we are talking about. When there is no imminent danger to a police officer, you must not apply a certain kind of force. And if you apply, the law is not saying do not apply force. Certainly you need a certain minimum of force to put people, to bring people under control. The law says apl application of excessive force. It must be reasonable and it must be proportional. Mm. I do not see how uh, a car that is fleeing from the police becomes a threat to the police mm. for them to open fire on, say, this fleeing car. That is unreasonable. Mm. That is not proportional and that is not necessary. So quickly, and that what is what we are talking about. That is what the do you want to, what forms of standards uh, do you want to see policing in this country so that we won't have these things recurring all the time? Well, absolutely, we are looking at global standards. We are looking at globally accepted standards that the police must use force only when their lives or property or other lives are, have come under threat. We are saying that the police force that they apply must be reasonable, it must be necessary, mm -hmm. and it must be proportional. These are accepted globally. And right. I think that to the extent that the IGP is championing this cause, I am very confident that he would also put in the necessary resources to train the police in this regard. Right. For instance, it is very difficult for the police sometimes to communicate to the citizenry. There are ways and means or strategies that you can even use to communicate disarm people yeah, right. and put them under yeah. arrest. This is what we are looking at, you know, moving forward, the right. IGP inculcating in the police service. Right, and Akoda, we're grateful for your time on today's big story. And we'll Thank wrap you, up Beth. with uh, Chief Superintendent Yakubu. So, Chief, if you're, you're there, I need to ask you quickly in a minute, uh, what do you think should be the way forward? Should we citizens be expecting uh, that the police will deal with us without necessarily violating our right? Should we not be afraid of them? Because some of us do. I mean, you come into contact with the police, and the first thing on your mind is you're cagey because you don't know where your rights will begin to be abused. There is no need for citizens of this country to uh, uh, continue to fear the uh, police mm. without any cause. All what we have been saying is that our job can successfully be uh, executed only when we have the uh, cooperation of the other side, and that is uh, right. the citizens of this country. Mm. We need to cooperate. We are paid by the citizens of this country to do a job on their behalf. So we don't see why people should be afraid of us. Mm. There are mistakes. We are human. 
would make errors. I heard Nana Yao uh, talking about uh, the police shooting their own colleagues. I believe that if he had known the full facts that the police was responding to an armed robbery, serious armed robbery uh, report, and then along the road, they met a vehicle going, they stopped the vehicle, and they failed to stop. At that point in time, under the justification in the use of firearms, the police were 100% justified in resorting to the use of firearms. Right. Except that, unfortunately, it turned out to be uh, wow. uh, an wow. judgment. Wow. Exactly. Right. So uh, what we are saying is that, for instance, if they had stopped, nothing of the sort would have happened. Right. There was no way, even if they were the armed robbers and they had stopped, there was no way the police would have fired at them in that manner. Right, we're grateful, so sir. These are uh, some of the, yes, sir. These, these are some of the uh, cooperation we are asking from the public. Right. When it is that you are ordered by the police to do something, just go just ahead and obey, obey the others. And insist upon your right. The obey. police administration has planned that campaign. Mm. We have other news where citizens can go report the conduct or misconduct of mm. police officers. And this would be investigated and action taken. Right. Currently, you would agree with me that the police service is the lead institution in this country that is trying to purge itself of uh, 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 indiscipline. Chief Supu, I, I don't uh, know uh, any organization in this yes, country mm. that can say they are doing better than we are doing. Well, we're grateful for your time, sir. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, that's all time will allow us. Uh, thank you thank very you. much, uh, Chief yeah, Superintendent welcome. Hamza. My name is Stephen Enti, and this is today's Big Story. We'll be right back with an interactive segment. Stay with us. Okay, no verification, no votes. Let's hear what you also think of that. Write here on JN through our social media platforms, facebook.com slash join news on TV, twitter.com slash join news on TV. The handles are at join news on TV and hash JN Interactive GH. You could also inbox us via join news IM at multitvworld.com. Let's hear what you think of that. But so the electric emission may just stands down the controversial no verification no vote standard used during the 2012 elections come 2016 electoral commission chairman dr afarijan at a consultative meeting on voter registration with the various political parties suggested persons who are unable to be verified by the machines should be allowed to vote as denying such persons will be infringing on their right. So um, Dr. Farijan was of the opinion that persons who could not be verified could be allowed to cast their ballot if they can produce two people to vouch for them. Let's hear Dr. Farijan talking about that. I'll be thinking ahead. We know that a lot of people were turned away on election day, even though they had gone through part of the process, the last bit where the biometric verification device would not recognize. Yeah. Some people have suggested, I'm throwing this to you for you to think about, have suggested that a similar provision could be used. Attestation could be used to allow people who had gone that far in the process to be able to vote. Interesting. So let me first take your WhatsApp comments and then we also find out what you make of this suggestion. So quickly, um, our first WhatsApp comment uh, is asking, well, it's coming from Flex Kweku Germain who says, then what is the use of the machine? Yeah. Mm, that's coming from Kweku Jermaine Flex. Thank you. Abdul Kudu says the EC must maintain the no verification, no vote. That's coming from 
Abdul Kudus. Nyako Richmond says, no wonder inconsistency at the highest level. Oh, Ghana. Nyako Richmond, thanks for contributing. Um, well, Patrick Mensa says, I personally agree with the seasoned EC chairman, Dr. Afarijan, to some extent, because in most of the rural communities, people virtually know each other by names and by faces. So you agree with him, right? Baba Musa says, so in such a situation, it will not be wrong to allow someone whose name and picture are in the voter register, but because of the verification device not to vote. The problem, however, would be the, uh, in the con cosmopolitan areas where it is difficult to identify all the people within your neighborhood. That's from Baba Musa, right? Um, we also have Jerry Kweku Danso who says, EC must tread much more cautiously in what ground rules they set for elections. 2016 can be very dangerous than Mr. Farijan, you would think. We have nowhere to go. Please look before you leap. God be with us. That's coming from Jerry Kweku Danso. Thank you, Jerry, for contributing. Fongo Abdul says, Dr. Afarijan is right. It is bad to reject persons who the verification machine do not identify. But in order not to cause confusion, care must be taken in that direction. That is, it should be conveyed to Parliament for necessary review and approval. That's also from Fungu Abdul. Thank you, Fungu. Right, so, um, Kwabena Amofa says, then they should stop using it. Otherwise, no verification, no vote. You write it, NV, NV. He shouldn't forget it's a law and has been gazetted, as he normally says. Right, so that's coming from Kwabena Amofa. Abdullah Abdul Razak says, hmm, what can we say again? But things must be done correctly to prevent future mishap that may occur. However, each and every Ghanaian have the right to vote. But I don't trust the integrity of the EC. That's coming from Abdullah Abdul Razak. All right, um, it's nice to hear from you. Ellis Johnson says, then what is the essence of the verification machine? That's a question for um, the EC, probably, um, Ellis Johnson. Thank you for your WhatsApp contribution. So um, uh, those were your comments, actually. Let's find out from some key politicians what they make of Dr. Afarijan's proposal. It is very fair to the voter. It depends upon uh, which side of the voters you are looking at. You see, this attestation can open a gate for people to uh, negatively influence the outcome of the elections. You see? So we don't want, once we are adopting this technology, we don't want any human factor that will temper with the results of that technology. But if you allow, you know, this attestation, you, you, you wouldn't know where it will end. But if it ends in somebody being able to change the results, it means that you are denying the majority of the people in that polling station who have a right to choose their MP. And it's better. I mean, in any technology or whatever, there's a margin of error. If you get one, two percent margin, for me, it's okay. Than getting people to do multiple voting, multiple registration, etc., where they haven't done it, only to confuse the results and then the backlash. Please, please. The co we, we, I'm completely against a window of opportunity for uh, a voter to go through uh, the voting process uh, when. Uh, the biometric information cannot be verified on the device. We have moved away from the old way of doing things. And there's a, a reason why we adopted that technology. The reason was to prevent multiple voting. 
and impersonation. So if we begin to uh, water down the security measures we have put in place, then we are defeating the purpose for the introduction of the biometric registration ex uh, voting verification exercise. Still biometric verification and this time it's also facial verification because people around will be able to attest that yes, this person with this ID card whose name has popped up, whose picture has popped up, is the same person. The only unfortunate thing is that the machine is unable to at this time recognize your fingerprint. There could be very many reasons. It could be that you have engaged in some what I call adult tax that your finger cells are, are all weak and therefore the machine cannot recognize it. And this is peculiar for our brothers who are in Galamse, our brothers who are doing hard jobs in the farms and what have you. And remember that normally during the voting is the harvest at the time. Right, so let's also join Sarah who's out there seeking from people what they also make of the suggestion. Thank you, Gladys. The EC chairman on a meeting on voters registration with various political parties suggested that those who have not been able to vote because they have not been they have not been verified by the machines should be given the right to vote and by not doing so is infringing on their rights. What do you think about this issue? Well, I don't think it's a good idea because that will give room to anybody at all to come and vote. Even non ghanaian uh, citizens can also come and vote. We agree as a people that we we'll use uh, some basic uh, requirements to qualify a person for the purposes of the elections. And so if those uh, conditions were given and all parties to it accepted it, I believe we should stick to what we agreed in principle, so that if you agree that we use the bi uh, verification, biometric verification to certify a person to be able to vote, then if the verification or the machine is denying uh, the person that's the per is saying the person is not uh, recognized, the person should not be allowed to vote. And if we have such a rule, that requires people to follow certain procedure, then those procedures must be followed. Now, it, it is the duty of the EC to ensure that the system they put in place to make sure people are able to um, go through these processes successfully are well managed so that people can go through the process because you cannot say that anybody um, who is at the voting age should be allowed to vote. If that's the case, then the ID cards and all the registrations won't be necessary. You just go there and then you say, ah, I can vote, I'm 18 years, I'm a Ghani, and this is my passport, and then you vote. I agree with him because uh, the so far as they are Ghanaians, they should be allowed to vote. Um, even when, when they attain the age to vote, then they should be given the right to, to exercise their function. We could not, we cannot 100% rely on the machines. However, if they have to be allowed to vote, then there must be an agreement between the electorate, between the political parties and then the government on what exactly has to be done before they're allowed to vote in an election during an, in an election day. That's what I believe has to be done. There must be an agreement, a solid document that is very transparent and clear to all the parties, all the, all the stakeholders involved on what has to be done. Thank you very much. Right, so let's quickly also hit Facebook and find out from some of you what you also have been sharing considering the proposal coming from the EC chairman, Dr. Afari Jan. So um, for the benefit of those who have just joined us, I'll read the topic again. For the 2016 elections, the Electoral Commission might just turn down the controversial no verification, no vote standard using during the um, 2012. So EC chairman, Dr. Afari Jan suggests Persons unable to be verified by the verification machine should be allowed to vote as denying them infringes on their right. And you have been sharing your thoughts with us. I'll take it from Kwabena Mofa who says then they should stop using it. Otherwise, no verification, no vote. Kudos to Might says if they know, uh, if they know no verification, no vote will infringe on people's rights then uh, why did they introduce the verification machine in the first place? Uh, EC should unite to find 
amicable solution to this verification issue. Abdul Razak says, hmm, what can we say again? But things must be done correctly to prevent future mishap that may occur. Abdullah again says, EC must have their own workers in all constituencies nationwide. But I still stand by the slogan, no verification, no vote. George Frimpon says, hmm, when did EC realize this? And what happens to all those who could not exercise their franchise in 2012? God save Mother Ghana. Uh, Nuruddin says, Afarijan is on spot. People who can't be verified should be allowed to vote after all they are registered for voting. If we don't control to this call by Afarijan, many eligible voters will be disenfranchised all the time. Kudos, Dr. Afarijan. Hola Weiss says, I will second Afarijan on this in that Machines are unpredictable and can be faulty at any time. Besides, depending solely on it might deny citizens the right to vote. Function Kwame Lawson says, for peace to prevail, let's go by the rules governing the elections. No verification, no vote. Frimpon Mansour Elvis says, double standard doctor. Hmm. Abu Bakari Mashhud says, I agree the EC boss, I agree with the EC boss because several of my party members were denied their right to vote, especially the old age in Tamale Kumbungu area. Rufai Abdu, Abudu says, I think this should come clear for us all to understand that Ghana is incapable of organizing a biometric elections. Razak Rafi again says, that is good because most of the old men and women in my village could not vote over 200 of them. Whoa, that's a lot of them. Musa Ibrahim says, EC is right, no verification, no vote. Uh, Emmanuel Perez says, the best is what is good for Ghana and that is what we desire. In order not to disenfranchise people, I think it will be imperative that we stand down for now the controversial NVNV, no verification, no vote. Johnson Obinampofu says, that's all that he have to say, cause anything less than this will disgrace the EC and could also bring violence in the country, which we don't want. All right, so um, I quickly would hit the phone lines and seek legal implications of this suggestion from the EC. And I have been joined by lawyer Kisi Ejeben. She is a legal practitioner and she's online now. Hello, lawyer. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, what, what do you make of this suggestion of, um, from the EC chairman? Sorry, I, I didn't get you there. I'm asking, um, the EC chairman is appealing that we stand down on the no verification, no vote um, regulation. And what do you make of that? Uh, across board or uh, selectively? Across board, I think. Well, that, uh, in my opinion, if a standard is going to be used, it should be one standard for all. And uh, if uh, the, the concern is that that the uh, system rejected some people who otherwise would not uh, would have been allowed to vote. Uh, it all depends on what we collectively want. If we want to lower the bar and make it a race to the bottom on, on an almost standardless list where uh, the, the verification system becomes lesser in a sense and in degree, that is up to us. But I would I would I would have uh, wish that uh, the standard uh, rather mean and actually uh, 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 to us to ensure the integrity of the whole electoral process. Uh, because if you're just going to leave it to uh, attestation by uh, some people that, oh, we know this best, and we know who it is, and that becomes the basis of uh, someone's eligibility uh, to vote, uh, then it can easily be wasted. I can easily, I'm not suggesting that that will be done, but it's feasible, it's plausible that I can easily wager it by just paying up people to show up to say, oh, there's a person who claims to be, and that becomes a standard. 
assistant jobs, especially in our society where we have all manner of names. One person can be Emmanuel Ama, can be Bukit Me, can be Petit Me because of uh, the accident of colonization and the fact that uh, we also have gay names and local names. It is dangerous in our setup and also because we do not have pinpointed addresses uh, as far as this naming and all of those things are concerned. So I, I, one would have thought that uh, verification by the person, by met metric data, was awesome. Uh, so I have my doubts about lowering the, the bar. But whatever it is, it must be one standard. We cannot have different standards uh, for, 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 for the several votes. Uh, the EC chairman again is proposing that we should review the law for 2016 elections. Um, is this possible to have it reviewed and how long would it take for the review to take effect? No, it's really not how long it takes. Uh, it is really a matter of the will change it. it, is, it I won't talk about possibility uh, because the law allows the EC or permits the EC uh, to, to table constitutional instruments before parliament. Parliament will consider it, and if uh, it matches up, uh, they will pass it into law. Every election, the public election, the, the general elections, are all governed by, by law. What governed uh, a 2012 election, uh, the constitutional instrument that governed the 2012 election, specifically for the 2012 election, and for the, the next public uh, general election, we will need specific law regulating uh, those specific elections. So definitely, there will be new, uh, there will be a new constitutional instrument governing the next general election. So as of possibility, I won't talk about possibility. Our, it is, I mean, something that is going to be, it, that is going to be factual. It will happen. As to whether we are prepared to lower the bar, that's uh, my main concern, in order to allow as many people as, uh, 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 eligible to vote, to be qualified to vote. All right, thank you so much, Lawyer Kisi Ejabin, for sharing your opinion with us. Lawyer Kisi Ejabin um, has been sharing with us what he makes of EC Chairman's uh, proposal. Let's quickly get back on Facebook and see what you more you have been sharing with us on Facebook. So I'll take it off from Wahab Abdul Fatal, who says it will be very hot in 2016 because this won't work. You're so sure about that, Wahab. Laron Lente says, hmm, GH 2016 election, we will go there again. Dusk Mick says, I don't think the verification thing is right. We can and should just brush it aside and focus on what we have until we have the right equipment to do the job. Abdul Rahim Igwe says, all those who are against no verification, no vote, are the multiple voters, so let it be no verification, no vote. <laughs> okay. Crack Abdul Hamza says, nobody has the right to disenfranchise anybody in this country except a court of the land. So the NVNV to, make, to me is a joke. Okay. Majida Wudu says, why can't you let this man go and rest? <laughs> okay. Ellis Johnson says, he can do whatever he likes. He thinks Ghana belongs to him and his allies, NDC, but God never sleeps. Afarijan, <laughs> he's a trouble. <laughs> Lava Laroy Lakoy says, what about the people who were denied in the last elections held? They can't do it. La, oh, it is Ghana. Ellis Johnson says, um, then what is the essence of the verification machine, huh? Right, so um, Ellis, you happen to be my last uh, comment on Facebook. Thank you so much for your contribution. But Steve, hey, Afarijan is in trouble. Though. <laughs> Whichever loves, party is in power. He loves controversy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to be in his shoes to be yeah, the chairman of the electoral commission. His shoes are too hot. You know, mm. you remember that during the last election, there were some photos of him on Facebook drinking mm. beer. Charlie, yeah, he's a crap. <laughs> right, anyway, so uh, stories to expect on News at 8 with Israel either. 2012 running mate of the new patriotic party, Dr. Mah. Mohamedou Baumia is proposing an amendment of the Bank of Ghana Act to make the governor accountable to parliament in the discharge of his duties. The former central bank governor says uh, such an amendment could help insulate the bank from executive manipulation.
Right, so uh, we also will tell you about um, the, uh, which, what has emerged at the Judgment Debt Commission sitting the existence of a special account at the Bank of Ghana used to settle judgment debt claims. The sole commissioner at Tuesday sitting had questioned the motive for the creation of such an account he says could send the wrong signal. So we'll bring you the details during news at eight. And uh, members of parliament uh, led by the second deputy minority whip are demanding the release of statutory funds due the various uh, metropolitan municipal and district assemblies before the house rises on February, uh, on Friday, I beg your pardon, March 28. So we'll bring you all of these uh, on news at eight with Israel Lai. My name is Stephen Antti, and that's how uh, we bring down the curtains. Mm. My name is Gladys Osei Oredi. We always appreciate your time. Thanks for staying with us. Good evening. Mm -hmm.